I'm Jim Rugg. My name is Ed Piscor. Today we're going to talk about the biggest selling cartoonist in the history of the world. But first, what have you been up to, Ed? Nothing much, man. And I have a far more modest career. Uh, also, I like to dabble in Satanism. And uh, the latest comic I'm working on is called Red Room. I'm serializing it on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Uh, the idea is, you know, those cam girl only fans type websites, man, you, you, you pledge a couple of dollars or whatever and they process requests for you. There's an urban legend online that there are murder versions of that, man. So I'm exploring a world where that, where that is true. And that's what Red Room's about. Put a couple of pages uh, every week up on the strip as well as a lot of background process material. This is the beginning of like the fourth story that I'm working on and uh, it's a EC inspired comic tale, man. I love this idea. I can't wait to read it whenever it's done. The Cryptocurrency Keeper. Very, very name. fun. <laughs> what is this? My latest book, Octobriana 1976, is Return from the Printers. There are three versions of it. The Fluorescent Blacklight, the 80s Black and White Explosion on newsprint, and the 70s style retro edition. Uh, these will be coming to comic book stores in late August, early September, and they'll be coming to Kickstarter backers before that. And uh, once my fulfillment is done, I will be posting what I have left online for anybody that missed it, either in comic shops or on the Kickstarter. So each of these will be available in shops. You could, you could choose your own flavor. No. <laughs> these are like variant covers. If your shop orders uh, 10 of these, then they will get a set of these. But I should have a few extra once I get done with fulfillment and with sending out those uh, variants to the shops. And again, whatever I have left will go online probably in a month or two. Oh, boy. But the reason we're here today, Ed, is to talk about Jack T. Chick, better known as Chick Tracks. Uh, there are over a billion of these have been made and distributed in over 100 languages, making him the biggest selling cartoonist in, in the world, really. Uh, the biggest theologian, you know, the biggest uh, missionary in a lot of ways. The volume of what he's put out in the world is uncontested by any, anything else in any of these fields. It's an interesting story. We're going to look at a few of the tracks. We're going to look at a little bit of Jack T. Chick's publishing history here today. And we're just going to walk through this, this guy who has contributed a lot of comics to the world and uh, has a very troubling legacy as a result of those comics. A lot of hate. Yes. So Jack Chick starts uh, publishing these things in around 1960. Jack T. Chick served in the Pacific Theater in World War II, fought in Okinawa, one of the um, most violent, most deadly uh, battlefields for inf infantrymen in World War II. That is where he served and was active. And so this is one of his early comics, Holy Joe. So when, when you say his early comics, he, he drew this stuff? He did. He did the drawings from about 1960 to the early 1970s. At that point, he hooked up with the main artist that draws the bulk of these, Fred Carter. I think he starts around 1972. And most of what you think of when you think of Chick Tracks is the artwork of Fred Carter. The way they worked, as far as I understand, is that Jack Chick would write the stories and do rough layouts. So before he was doing these, he actually did some comics locally uh, in California. He's from the Los Angeles area, and uh, he did some comics that would appear in, I forget the publication. They weren't religious comics. They were more of a traditional, what you think of as, you know, gag cartooning kind of style. Um, and so the beginning Chick Tracks, he drew himself because, you know, that's what he had to work with. Uh, Carter found him. He was uh, also a preacher that had some art talent, found a couple of these illustrated some scripture as samples and sent them to Jack T. Chick. A couple weeks later, they start working together, been working together ever since. Um, I pull out Holy Joe because this is probably the closest, I don't want to say auto bio, but it shows some battles. So what happens is there's a Christian in this, uh, in this platoon and everybody kind of gives him a hard time except one guy who's nice to him. And whenever they get out and actually get into the fighting and the killing and the, and the war, the guy who was nice to him, he does not know Jesus Christ. But the guy, his sergeant, who was very hard on him, recognizes that he might die here and uh, wants to get to heaven. And he accepts Jesus Christ as a savior. And so the end of this story and the end of a lot of these stories, it's about whether you go to heaven or hell. 
And in this case, the good guy who didn't know Jesus goes to hell. The bad guy who tortured him the whole story but repents at the end does go to heaven. And so that's the basis of all of these things. And part of the troubling legacy of Jack T. Chick is that it's called hate literature. You know, it's been banned in many places from communist nations. South Africa has banned it. Canada has banned Chick tracks. Canada, because of the hate literature. And it's all, um, I think of them, they remind me of like EC Comics because they're the same formula. And you get to the end and it's a choice of, do you follow this very Protestant interpretation of the Bible and salvation or don't you? And then we get to see the end results. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, that's your twist ending in a lot of these things that would be the equivalent of an EC Comics. This Was Your Life was his first breakthrough hit. This is probably the second or, or third track that he made. And it originally was done for prisoners. He made it kind of as a, almost like a chart of these comics. And it's the same deal. It's about a guy who dies and he's being uh, judged. You know, he goes to heaven or goes to, I guess, the gates of heaven to be judged. And this is the God depiction in all of these things. It's a figure on a white throne with no features on his face. And, you know, is your name, which book is your name in, in other words. And so a lot of these things, they do appeal to prisons, uh, you know, people in prison. And they're aimed at that, you know, from whatever bad deeds you can ascribe to these characters, they're covered. Pedophiles, uh, abusive people, murderers, and they either do or don't find their redemption, but it is, they all end with, this is how you get to heaven. And there's even like the step-by-step -step guide in every single one of these as to what you need to do, how to pray to get to heaven. So a lot of the information that I am going over comes from Daniel Rayburn, who published four issues of The Imp. Uh, one was about Dan Klaus, one Chris Ware, one Mexican historietas, and then this one with a Dan Klaus cover that's all about the Chick tracks and the, uh, the history of Jack T. Chick. Fascinating guy. You know, um, this is, he wasn't even a Christian in World War II. He comes to that later after he's married. Yeah, after he brutalized a bunch of dudes, probably. Yeah, probably, you know, in a state of PTSD uh, or something, he, he finds his way to, to Christianity, but then becomes devout and evangelical. Uh, he breaks with the church. You know, the churches, most of them don't like his version of uh, Hell and Brimstone and, again, hate literature in, in a lot of these cases. And so he separates from the church and he just makes comics. And he makes comics until he dies at age 92. He has continued to make comics after that for a couple of years because he, you know, he knew he wasn't going to live forever and basically had these planned out to continue after he had passed. He also made full-size comics. Um, several issues of the Crusaders, and these are brutal type comics. So this is a hitchhiker, um, 1974. So this is a hitchhiker, you know, a little bit of hippie, whatever, getting picked up in the in the in the van going cross country. Unfortunately, picked up by a cult of Satanists who then sacrifice and kill her. And this isn't a story of her redemption. She dies right here, you know. But clearly, like what you think of as comics, full color, you know, aimed at. at all ages are young readers in a lot of cases, and very harsh content. Um, this is this is one that I thought I would pull out. It's called Scarface, and it reminds me of another religious comic. A little bit of Arseface, uh, shades of, Ar of Garth Ennis's preacher character Arseface, uh, many decades beforehand in one of these comic books about the Crusaders. This is one of the most popular ones. Like I, like I see that in all the quarter bins, the Exorcist one, probably based on the title alone, like well, like when the Exorcist flick comes out, like this is probably not too far before or after. Well, he was waging a uh, <laughs> interesting stuff about this. He hooks up with a woman who claimed to be doing exorcism. She was a doctor. I think she lost her license at that point, and somehow they hooked up. And did several, did a few chick tracks together, but I think that may be where this comes from is the collaboration with this woman um, who claimed to, you know, witness these and participate in exorcists. So, it, do, like, I know exorcism happens in Catholicism. Does that happen in Protestant stuff? Like, I'm saying he was hooking up with a Catholic heathen? <laughs> it's a good point because let me, let me list some of his enemies. So, these are enemies that he incurred various wrath or ban or hate literature labels from. 
abortion, drugs, evolution, homosexuality, rock music, the Roman Catholic Church, Judaism, Mormonism, Islam, Freemasonry, Illuminati, Satanists, witches, pagans, but also Dungeons and Dragons, Harry Potter, Halloween, and updated translations of the Bible. Uh, part of his religion was the King James Version from 1611. That was it. Don't don't go any further with any revisions. And so, as you can imagine, like he's he alienates everybody in that list. And you know, we would all be fine with whatever you want to say about Satanists. Nobody's going to raise you know any flags about criticizing Satanism. He would apply that same vitriol though to everything, <laughs> Mormonism. Uh, you know, you name it. It was getting 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 that kind of thing. And so. Here's another example um, that I wanted to show off, the sissy. This, I believe, is definitely Carter's artwork, and I like the art a lot in this. You know, you can kind of see these tough guy types were, um, you know, some of the art's very competent, very well done, interesting types. And so in this case, these two truckers show up, and they see this Jesus Saves bumper sticker on another truck. And he's making fun of it, how, you know, Jesus is a sissy, turn the other cheek, that kind of thing. And a giant trucker gets off of there and he's like, let me, let me get you guys dinner and talk about this. You know, and it's like this big giant muscle dude. And so as they're discussing it, you know, he's talking about how tough Jesus really is. And at one point he's describing the way he was, uh, you know, whenever he was crucified, the violence that was put on him in the course of being crucified, this would be. Mel Gibson would love this. I was just thinking, like, <laughs> Beavis and Butthead, like, that, that's pretty cool. He, they stabbed him in the rib. So he references, like, what's going on, you know? They beat him with a whip that had chunks of metal and bone in it. Again, super violent, this stuff. You know, the imagery, the words, everything. And then the footnote, you know, like, see uh, Amazing Spider-Man 136 for the first appearance of this character. This one is, see the gift for medical view of the crucifixion. This is what you're looking at. Ugh. That's as violent as, and gory as what, anything that we see in, in any kind of, like, 80s, 90s superhero comics, you know, more realistic, violent, pushing-the-edge superhero comics, none of them go to this this level. Um, you know, and very graphic language describing exactly what's happening, how you die from this. Awful. As graphic as you can possibly imagine. So, uh, eventually, you know, this guy's story and explanation of just how tough Jesus really is uh, convinces these two truckers, and not only them, but they are then joined by the waitress who's been waiting on them at this little truck stop diner. She wants to join them in in, uh, in prayer and finding their salvation. So, so Jim, uh, these you said a billion of these things are out there now. We are we are we're we're in the game. So so we sort of we know the story. And I'll be honest, I've never have seen these uh, in the wild. Perhaps I wasn't looking, but how would these things be distributed, man? Like, they don't go through the Diamond Catalog. No. You know what? Good story on that. He, they would have gone through Christian bookstores for a long time, and churches could buy them. You know, like, like there are distribution uh, routes like any other industry. And so, like, Christian bookstores were a network that he was part of and where you could buy these. In the early 80s, he hooks up with this guy, Alberto Rivera, who claimed to be a Jesuit, a very high-level priest in the Catholic Church, who escaped that and then came out with... There's a lot of conspiracy theory in here, from Illuminati to the Catholic Church. Like, he, he basically refers to the Pope that the Antichrist will be the Pope. Is, is You can find that, you know, in his teaching in a lot of this stuff. And so uh, he did a five-part series on this guy who everybody that he's teamed up with gets discredited at some point. So it's conspiracy stuff is what this is. And it's conspiracy stuff against the Catholic Church. And so as Chick was like ramping up his anti-Catholic Church rhetoric and, and publications, the Catholic Church responded and was like, hey, Christian booksellers, we don't want you carrying this guy's stuff who's slandering us and blaspheming us and, and discrediting us. And so in 1981, he parts ways with the Christian Booksellers Association or organization. I can't remember their exact name, but, you know, it's a big group of these Christian bookstores. He parts ways with them and begins, you know, distributing himself. He was a very early adopter to selling online, which super smart. It's how I, you know, I bought a box of these things for like 10 bucks, five bucks. You know, you can buy like a big pack of them. And so that's how I got hold of them. 
but he was very early on selling online. And, and these things, they would, they would go for a, a dime a piece. So what people would do is they would, they would get a grip of these things and put them in every Pit, Pittsburgh city paper, you know, uh, unsolicited to, uh, to, to save your, your, your soul or something. Yeah, and some churches would buy, you know, like like I would see these in various churches that I went through. Um, sometimes they would even just be like in a kind of in a basket, like, you know, help yourself to some, give them to somebody. The idea of these is to witness to people. Um, you know, I mentioned that they're very popular and what, in and prisons. What, and, and, what the, and what does uh, to witness to people mean? Well, uh, you, find, you find the heathen that, uh, you know, doesn't know Jesus. And you give him one of these, and you and you pick the poison. So if uh, your little nerdy cousin man is going on and on about his MMORPG characters, <laughs> yes, you give him that Dungeons and Dragons, right? One. Dark Dungeon, one of the one of the most popular, uh, you know, of of these strips, did deal with Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, got a lot of acclaim. I don't know if a claim notoriety maybe is the better word, because because what happens is uh, that's the one that I remember, and and what happens is. Little 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 Joey is so invested in his character, and eventually, like in the in the game, the character dies. So what he does that night is he strings up a fucking noose in his uh in the fan in his bedroom or something, kills kills his real life body. Not the only time kids are committing suicide in these. Uh, got in trouble in 2011 whenever one of his uh, one of these strips was given away for Halloween from a, uh, a church I think in Ohio called Mean Mama. That featured child suicide. Throwing that into your uh, into your neighbor's trick or treat pumpkin. Um, Daniel Rayburn, writer of the Imp, one of the things that he talks about is he, he compares these to spiritual porn and describes them about the climax is always these characters on their knees, kind of like you know shaking with with passion and sobbing and, and agony as salty body fluid of tears coat their smooth cheeks. Um, you know it's it's very much. A part of these is very much like that obsession with the seduction and the humiliation of the conversion. Um, kind of weird, but you know, like if you put it into that fetish area, it, it makes it strange. So, as I said, Jack Jack Chick kind of wasn't affiliated with the church. Um, was said to be threatened by tons of people. Death threats had his house and car shot up, and basically thought better not to bring that to a church. Uh, and so he kind of withdrew from that and just dedicated his life to this, you know, just to the conversion again, to the witness, to the evangelizing, to the uh, to the unsaved. And that's pretty much all he did from 60 until he died in 2016 and beyond. You know, it's still up and running. There are people that have kind of like taken on the work after him. No photographs of him were published after 1948 until after he died. And Part of it, like his followers would say, it's because he was uh, humble and wanted to give all the glory to God. Didn't want to take any credit for this. But the flip side of it is facing death threats from everybody. You know, everybody. He alienated every organization. This was the only way to salvation as far as he was concerned. And and it's his life's work, clearly. Did, did the guy die a zillionaire by selling a billion of these things? Do, do you know those details? I think in 2000... I had a number somewhere, but it was three million dollars was the profit one of these years, early two thousands. I don't know how accurate that was. I, I saw a lot of articles on this. There have been documentaries. Uh, I watched a documentary called God's Cartoonist that talks to many of the people that are involved in this. Not not Chick, although there are some audio recordings in that documentary. Um, but I mean, you know, very successful. You know, like you watch the documentary, and at the end, there are like five thousand tracks have been sold in the time of watching this documentary. So, you know, it's a huge operation. You don't distribute a billion of these things without constantly sending them out. And you see things like, you know, Titanic is, is one here. Sin City, which came out after the uh, the Sin City movie. Humbug, I don't think is related to uh, Kurtzman's Humbug at all. Although that, that art kind of makes me wonder. But he would do things like Terminator. He did uh, Walking Dead, you know, is, is the title of one. So it was whatever he could possibly do to try to get these in front of people. When When did he die? 2016. Oh, wow. Yeah, 92 years old and still working, you know. And so it has that weird... Think of a 92-year-old writing a story about kids or contemporary anything. I mean, that's, you know, that's older than your grandfather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, everything that's new, like, 
you know, I wonder if there was a video game when Nintendo. Yeah, that would make total sense. You, you, you'd almost assume there have to be one of the the uh, one of the tracks that gets a lot of negative attention is called Lisa, and it's about a pedophile. Uh, and the the reason it's criticized is it's the pedophile, you know, being a pedophile the entire strip, and then at the very end finds Jesus and goes to heaven. Right. Not something that people are too happy about. But if you're distributing that in prisons, you know, like that was his part of his reason that he didn't, he, he sort of wasn't into Christians. You know, he said that's preaching to the choir. Like that's not who he's trying to reach. Wild shit, man. Yeah, for sure. I, I wanted to throw a couple out there that I don't have in case any of the kayfabers out there have some extras in their collection that they're looking to part with. A uh, few of the ones that I don't have... Why No Revival, that's his first uh, his first track. And they get reworked, too. It makes it hard to track these things because they do get uh, redone. You know, sometimes you get Carter comes in as an artist. Maybe you redraw them. Um, Fred Carter is, a, is an African-American. And so they would take some of the most popular tracks and they would redraw them with African-American characters, uh, you know, with the intention of, again, reaching, reaching a wider audience. Um, same thing with why you would do over 100 different languages same deal just trying to reach as many readers as possible uh some of the other titles i'm looking for dark dungeons the dungeons and dragons episode soul story the first jaws this is a jonah in the well story but again capitalizing on jaws you get a blockbuster movie maybe you get a chick track to come out of it the terminator was one so lots of uh, anti-halloween was one of his big you know targets all the time constantly and there are several of these things i mentioned the church getting in trouble for passing these out at halloween uh that's something that they promote on the yeah, this is this is a send up of like horror movie tropes um you know i can't endorse these but i think it is a cartoonist to not be ignored uh, a lot of people that write about him put him into the underground comics category because he was self-publishing you know he was doing this all on his own there's a lot of similarities to certainly the underground movement and the way those comics were self-published and uh, distributed in alternative channels uh, so similar idea um, with the chick tracks the, this this skill is so odd uh, I was looking for like a blank piece of paper because I wanted to like butt these up and try to figure out like is this an eight and a half by eleven. Yeah, we can hold one on there. One thing about about the size. Is that eight and a half by eleven? Um, not quite. So I I don't I, yeah I can't tell you the exact reason for the you know the sizing, but I I will say same size as like a Tijuana Bible. Yeah. So pretty strange stuff. I definitely found some of these growing up. You know, this would have been the kind of thing that my parents might not like me reading comics when I was a kid. They would never pay any attention to this. I would have been welcome to read any of these things, regardless of how offensive uh, the stories and the content were. Um, he did one called The Gay Blade. That mm -hmm. was probably his most... He says it was the one that received the most hate mail. He actually prided himself on receiving hate mail. Uh, you know, he, he felt that if, if he wasn't receiving hate mail, these things really weren't fine, getting out in the world and, and reaching people. Um, like I said, I think it's a cartoonist that's hard to ignore. Once he passed, several books were published about him, including one that was published by, uh, you know, Chick Publications. Um, he is a publisher or, or, or was a publisher that's still up and running at this point. So there is an authorized biography about him that they published that kind of just tells the story of a guy who, you know, lived an isolated life. And this is really the only piece that remains. One last note. Most of these are readable on his website. Yes. And I don't have that. <laughs> I don't have the URL in front of me, but if you Google Chick Tracks, you, you will find that. And uh, it's a very easy way to see these, including Dark Dungeons, the, uh, the infamous Dungeons and Dragons track. That's how I read them all in the, in the early 2000s when I, I first heard of the phenomenon. Because, I, like I said, I, I never happened upon these things out in the wild and, and would just hear the stories of like, yeah, man, they would, they're, they're in phone booths and shit like that. Laundromats is one they love to, uh, to cite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe order a batch of the happy Halloweens and, uh, boo for, uh, Halloween this year. If you want to, if you want to <laughs> spice up your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and you know, we, as Ed said, we see the comic books, 
these all came out of 50 cent boxes, quarter boxes and stuff like that. So pretty ambitious as a publisher. Oh, and the way that he started thinking of, of doing these tracks is because a missionary, radio missionary that he met, I believe, in World War II said that this is how the Communist Party distributed their propaganda in China. And it was all his comics, comic pamphlets. And so uh, he thought if it worked for the Chinese government, for the communist government, communist party, that it would be uh, perfect for uh, to to bring people to Jesus. Yeesh. That's, that's that is that is perfect, man. I think about all of the uh, propaganda pamphlets that have little comic book imagery that have been dispersed uh, through many many wars, man. And these have been satirized by everybody. Starting with National Lampoon, I think did one of the most famous ones in the early seventies. I think it's called Dead Shop or Head Shop. Uh, pretty famous one. Dan Klaus does, you know, Devil Doll Devil in the Doll, uh, yeah. first issue of Eight Ball, I believe. So it's definitely floated around uh, plenty. Yeah, yeah. And Klaus definitely has drawn this imagery in like blab. Yes. In the eighties and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a certain kind of a apocalypse that that you get to read about here. You know, it's it's such it's almost anything goes, and it goes from things that are, you know, highly offensive to then like gunslinger. Converting the gunslingers, <laughs> yeah. Because the Wild West was around when he was a kid, probably. I love this. This to me is like real fun cartooning. The character design and the story here is that this outlaw is sent in by the uh, the local saloon keeper to the church to murder the preacher who's you know stirring up trouble. And so uh, he goes to church to kill that preacher, and of course he's converted. But a marshal, a straight up you know white hat wearing marshal, rides in with the bounty on this guy's head. Kills, takes him into custody and hangs him the next day. And when the preacher tries to con to talk to the marshal about going to heaven, he's not interested. You know, he he's he's an upright guy, man. He's a good guy. If he doesn't go to heaven, nobody should. And of course, uh, the end of the story: gunslingers in heaven, the uh, marshals in hell. There's only one way to heaven, according to Jack T. Chick. Man, <laughs> let's get these things off our damn <laughs> kayfabe screen already. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell icon, we'll notify you when uh, new videos are available. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist K Fabe e newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist K Fabe merchandise and t shirts at the links below this video. I gotta take a shower after this one, Jimmy, <laughs> man. Give these guys their marching orders. Read more comics. <laughs>